All right, so let me, we're going to be reading, everything's going to be vocal tonight, verbal, no, no uh, on-screen images, unfortunately. So we're going to have to pay more close attention to the words. And, and it's going to be a little bit shorter tonight. We're going to be focused more uh, in, uh, in terms of um, uh, getting right to the text and looking at the content. And we'll have probably a little bit more commentary than usual. Uh, so let's read the, the following passage. This is Revelation 3, 14. 2.22, and then we'll go into the commentary and uh, with the help of uh, Father Athanasius. Uh, the words, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know thy works, you are neither cold nor hot, would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spare, spew you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. Not knowing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. And therefore, I counsel you, to buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may be rich, and while and white garments to clothe you, and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and chasten. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to, into him and eat with him, and he with me. He who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So that is the text for tonight we'll be looking at and commenting on. And hopefully if you don't, uh, if you want to consult that text, you might want to go and uh, open up the King James Version or uh, that's mainly what I would use or the Orthodox New Testament if you have it and look at that text and have it in mind as we go through. We're not going to be going back as we do usually in the PDF and showing again each verse. So keep that in mind. So this epistle is going to the Christians in Laodicea. And this is a flourishing center uh, uh, in the ancient world. So there was much commerce, much industry, and therefore there was affluence. So this community that is being written to is not unlike much of the mo modern world and the modern West and America and uh, much of the affluent uh, first world today. Obviously, the, uh, the cancers and the poisons that they suffered uh, and that we also suffer today. Uh, so the bishop, the first bishop of the city was Archippus, uh, and we're not sure if this epistle actually went to him or to one of his successors, uh, but the ethical, spiritual, and the material state of the city seems to have left its mark on the Christians and on the bishop in particular of the church of Laodicea. Very materialistic way of life. This, this, this is an epistle that is directed to all of us. As I like to say, and I've said it many times, do not consider yourself poor. No one, almost no one today in the first world should consider themselves poor. We're all extremely wealthy. Even if we make 20 or 50 or 100,000, whatever we might make, it doesn't matter. Because, why? Because modern technology has made us more pampered more comfortable than any king of any country in the history of the world. Why? Because technology makes life extremely easy comparatively. Even I was uh, visiting in Nashville uh, at the very nice, just to give you one example, personal example, we were at the um, uh, home of the uh, uh, Andrew Jackson. So this was a plantation. This was a, you know, a very wealthy man in his day president of the United States, and even he had to go out to the outhouse. Even he had to go and 
uh, did not have running water in his house and any of the things that we take for granted today. But no technology, could not speak to people on the other side of the earth. None of that. He was not unlike many of his contemporaries, even if he was a wealthy man, because there were certain basic things that everyone had to do and were subject to. Uh, of course, he was comparatively uh, well off and all the rest, but compared to us today, even if we do not have great wealth because of modern technology, we are extremely pampered. And that's the problem. The problem is the extreme ease and comfort and the arrogance that comes born from that. And apparently this was also uh, a problem for the bishop of Laodicea, the self-sufficiency and self-assurance that comes from an affluent life. And that's not a surprise then why this epistle and this bishop is the recipient of the most severe of all the epistles. So again, wake-up call for all of us today. This epistle is a wake-up call for all of us because we're all guilty of much, probably much worse uh, and much more. Uh, off, or worse off than the Bishop of Laodicea. But at the same time, it is epistle, even though it's very harsh, it combines beauty, harsh uh, strictness, along with tenderness. And this is the beauty of proper, I mean, Christ showing his love at the same time, his strictness, those things, those are not opposed. In fact, they're inseparable. And that's very contrary to the pedagogy of many today, the idea that you can be only, only, you know, uh, with laxity or with ease or with uh, with praise and all the rest, you're going to raise a child. No, that's not the case. You have to be also strict at times if you're going to show true love. And so here we have this in this epistle, and that's the true uh, pastoral, uh, the pimantiki, the the true Orthodox Christian pastoral work is going to include times of strictness, and that we should be grateful to that. We should be grateful. We'll get into that a bit later. So it's interesting that the, the, the epistle and the Lord is speaking to them uh, in their own language and, and, and using uh, examples from essentially the life of the city. Another example for all of us pastors to remember that to make it applicable, appealing, uh, and easily understood uh, using imagery and examples from the daily life of the people that you're talking to. So in this city, it was a successful center of commerce, and the Lord refers to wealth. It also was a center for ophthalmology. So the Lord refers to eye salve, right? And this is not uh, an accident. This is all intentional on the part of the Lord. He comes down in very particular very particular in, in, in his uh, 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 in his teaching, and let's look at the first name, the I am, the Amen. So that's the first name. You, the words of the of the Amen, the words of the Amen. That's very interesting. That we usually don't think of Amen in the sense of it being the Amen. But what? Let's look at the, the the history of this word, and we'll see that it actually is applicable to God. Not just so be it, as we use it in in um, in, this, in the liturgy, liturgical life, but it's a title belonging to God. And in Isaiah sixty five sixteen, we see that some translators translate God as the Amen. In the Septuagint, we have it as God of Truth. So a little bit different. When Jesus says, I am the Amen, this means that he has the same title that the Lord Yahweh has in the Old Testament. Another example, and there are many in the book of Revelation, that shows the identification of Jesus Christ with the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, the Lord of the Old Testament, and puts to shame again the various Aryan sectarian heretics of all ages, including the contemporary Jehovah's Witness, who are Aryans in every way. And this is not at all. Um, something that we should just take lightly and say, oh, that's the stupid, uh, you know, sectarians over there. You know, we just kind of disdain them because, well, we think, how could anybody become a Jehovah's Witness? But that's not right at all, because Arianism is not restricted at all today to a few Jehovah's Witness. In fact, all of Europe is Arian today. The West is Arian today. This is the norm. People consider Jesus Christ a creation vast majority of the former Christian peoples, once upon a time in the West, 
have embraced Arianism full, and this is a, this is the great tragedy. Uh, we read in terms of the term Amen in Corinthians 1, 19 to 20. For the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, whom we preached among you, Siloanos and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it was always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why we utter the Amen through him to the glory of God. The Amen. So, we have uh, the Lord is the truth. He is the Amen. He is the yes. He is trustworthy. So it says in Timothy, the Apostle Paul says in Timothy, the saying is sure and worthy of all full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So he is also referred to in the second here as the true witness. The true witness. The God, the Logos, and this is the... Uh, the fourth name that Christ gives himself and refers to praxis, the work of Christ, uh, the trustworthy incarnate God, uh, the word. Uh, and then the fourth name is the beginning of God's creation. Very interesting, the beginning of God's creation. And here's where we see again uh, something that might be applicable to the question of Arianism, because this is how the Arians misinterpreted one of the passages they misinterpreted to think that God is a creature. Uh, and this does not refer to him as the object, but the subject. In other words, he is here the one who is, and through, who, through whom all of creation has its beginning, right? He's the origin. So all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made, the Apostle John says. So all things were made through God the Word, and not that he was the first of all creation, but that he was the source of all creation through which all creation comes into being. I am the beginning of the creation. Uh, the word beginning here, as St. Andrew of Casabia beautifully interprets, refers to the initial dominant and uncreated cause of the creatures, of the creations. Just as a little side, a little experience, we were driving up here, stopped at a gas station, man there probably in his 40s comes up to me asks for some money i start to talk to him and he, had, he actually knew i was an orthodox christian which was interesting it's rare that's pretty rare so he's it looks like somebody who's interested in some kind of spiritual life so uh, i think i said we said some words then i said do you do you pray oh he says i read the scriptures and in the scriptures i find answers to all my problems i said it's wonderful thank god so do you pray he says yes i pray uh i pray to the earth and then I pray to God in heaven, whoever that is. You're not really sure who that God is. Uh, and we had a discussion there. And I said, well, you know, the creature, creation, the earth, uh, when we worship the creature, well, that's called idolatry. So praying to the creature or creation is idolatrous. He, of course, he didn't, he didn't respond, didn't understand. And so here you have... Right there, and this is very common today, you have people who are worshiping the creation and thinking that it is it has some kind of divinity. That's an idolatrous stance. Well, making Christ into, thinking Christ is a creature and then worshiping him would be analogous delusion. So if you're going to worship, whatever you're worshiping, if it's not uncreated, it's not worthy of, of worship. It's not worthy of adoration in that sense, as God, as God. So here we have simply, again, the beginning of all creation, God's creation, it is simply that he is the one through whom all things were created. He is the initial cause of all uh, creation. He's the one who said, let there be light. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, it says in Genesis. Uh, Jesus Christ created the heavens and the earth. God said there, let there be light. Jesus Christ created this light, and so on. This is the touchstone, the button that Arius tried to press and twist to support the blasphemy, this blasphemy, right? The church fathers fought Arius because behind Arius was the treachery of the devil. Behind every heresy, behind every heresy is the devil. So when, so when there is a, when we talk about heresy, when we say this is a heretical thing, very serious, extremely serious. We're talking about life and death. We're talking about the devil or God. We're talking about light or darkness, truth or falsehood. And so when the fathers stand up and fight against something, obviously 
it's a matter of salvation. They're not going to fight against a heresy that's not a matter of salvation. And the Arianism is certainly one of those. And there are many Arianisms throughout church history, as we said. Uh, Elder Athanasius says the following. Arianism did not go away because the devil did not go away. <laughs> Today, my friends, Europe is re reliving the heresy of Arius. Europe and the West in general is Arianizing. Arianizing. Father Eustin Popovich very beautifully explained this in his book, Man and the God-Man, now St. Eustin Popovich. He dedicates a special study that refers to the Arianizing of Europe and the West. I am voicing my concern because we are now, this is Elder Athanasius speaking in the 1980s, all right? 1980s. He says, I'm very concerned because we are now members of the common market, European Union, and we will begin to have many things in common with the other European nations. Unfortunately, the godlessness in Europe and America, uh, as my addition, and this Arianism of Europe will find its way here to Greece in such a way that we will begin to develop a different mindset. So he's saying already, it's all happening, it's all coming. We're going we're gonna to lose the orthodox mindset. Of course, they'd already in, in many ways lost it when they decided at that point in the late 70s to enter into European union and all the rest that was a sign that they were on their way as a as a nation as a government as a as leadership they're on their way to a merging with with apostate europe and identifying themselves as as the europe of charlemagne that's the tragedy not the roman europe the europe of charlemagne which is the europe of the last seven eight hundred nine hundred years for sure it's not a thousand is the heretical europe it's the Europe of the Filioque. It's the Europe of Arianism. And they will, people, he says, will begin to look at Christ as the great reformer, a great teacher, but not as the Atheanthropos, not as the God man, which of course is studying the sage for the, uh, the rise of Antichrist. That's that's a big part of the rise of Antichrist. When the formerly Christian peoples embrace Arianism and live Arianism, then you have Antichrist. You have the spirit of Antichrist and you have the preparation for Antichrist. And so this is no small thing. And so again, he is the beginning of all creation in the sense that he is the source, the archi, through which and, all, and by which and in which uh, the creation is, comes to be. So Christ is initiator of God's creation. He is the subject. Christ, uh, creation is the object. Did I say, I said, it, I think I said it. Did I said, no, that's how I said it. Yeah. That he is the subject. Creation is the object. He is the initiating force behind the creation of things. St. Paul says it in the following way. For in him, all things were created. How, how can you be an Arian? If, if you read Apostle Paul, how can you come to Arians? It's amazing to me. People uh, so so foolish to follow in behind the footsteps of Arians. In, all, in him, all things are created in heaven and on earth. In heaven and on earth. Invisible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities, all Things were created through him and for him. He's obviously not a creature. He's obviously not a creation. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. What is before all things? Only God is before all things. So that's enough of that. I think we understand that. Let's move on to the main theme now of the epistle, and that is the following words to the Bishop of Laodicea. I know your works, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Very, very important and potent words for all of us. Because if we're honest, we are the milk toast of church history. We poor last Christians of the eighth millennium, ogdoites, as they say in Greek, we are unfortunately the vast majority of us lukewarm and if we have any warmth in us we are going to be the first to say that we have we are lukewarm if you are if you are not ready to admit that you're lukewarm you are definitely lukewarm see how that works if you stand and say no 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 no, no i'm good i'm good you're probably 90 percent sure you're lukewarm you are in very grave danger as you'll see that's the worst spot of all worse than being cold 
is being lukewarm. Now, we'll talk about what does it mean? Somebody who's lukewarm, how does it happen? Uh, there's so much we could talk about here. Let's see what we can, we have to narrow it down. But the great majority of Christians, Elder Athanasius says, today, at least the contemporary Christians belong to this class and state. As contemporary Christians, we are not cold and certainly not hot. Most of us are lukewarm. So here we have a great class of Christians, according to the prophet Elias, limp with both legs. These, we are those who limp with both legs. <clears throat> Live the psychology of Israel. If you know the Old Testament and the story of Israel and all the killing of the prophets and all of the apostasies, the various idol worshiping, you know what that means, the psychology of Israel. The same Israel which easily came forward to worship the true God, but also displayed the same ease in running off and offering equal worship to the false gods. According to St. Paul in this class of the lukewarm, faithful God and the word, Christ and Baal, truth and lie, have the ability to intertwine, intertwine and coexist. you know how awful that is? That is the spirit of the world today, Absolutely syncretism, new age movement, the various perennialisms and universalisms. What is that? But wanting to avoid the cross of Christ, wanting to have both hand, but in the worst sense, both the world and God, right? Not both hand as the patristic both hand, but the invert, which is the destruction of life in Christ, Wanting to have two masters, wanting to be able to say, look, I am a respectable, bright, and worldly person that everybody should say you're really something in the world with worldly criteria. And yet I'm also a Orthodox Christian. And that's, uh, and you know, just to, to, to want to have that uh, both hand, which is demonic, uh, The sign also that these this is who we are, if we are like this, God help us, is that we we want to have that. We want to have two masters. We want to live in two worlds. We want to be able to remain in the world, according to the world, live the, live the life of the world, be, be famous, be rich, be, be all this. We'll put on our makeup for women and be beautiful for all the, in the worldly ways. People will say, you're not strange because you don't wear makeup. Women have this, women out there who listen to me, Father, what are you talking about? Yes, yes, that's all moved by love of the opinion of others and what people say about us. A lot of ways we can live with, in two kingdoms, try to be both and in that demonic way, right? And at the same time, these poor people who want to have two masters they boast their high level of spiritual life. They're good Christians. Their greatness. They're very important. They're pleased with their uh, high position in the world. And they don't realize that they're on the path of perdition. And I think here is what Elder Athanasius says some beautiful things we should pay close attention to. He's talking about the pastoral work. Now, all of you priests out there, all of you people who have pastoral responsibility for the kingdom, of, for the for the people of the kingdom, listen to what he says. If you suggest to people in this sad spiritual state of lukewarmness and double double mindedness, if you suggest to them uh, that they study the scriptures, that they leave, read the lives of the saints, that they read the ascetic literature that they make that a priority in their life, they will tell you that they already know the scriptures. I remember I remember one story from my time in the village in, in Greece. We had a someone who came and was very excited. And I said, here, read read the scriptures. And, oh, and within like three days, she came back and said, yeah, I read, I read the whole scripture. I read, I read it all. Uh, you know, and I said to myself, God, I've been in the church for how long? And I feel like I barely know the scriptures. I just the beginning and, and she read it in three days, and then it turns out that it was all just this kind of lukewarmness. If you tell them to go to church, they will tell you that they are better than all the other people who go to church. How many times did I hear that as a pastor in Greece? Oh, my gosh. I remember one man, bless his heart, he said, I'm not going to church with all those hypocrites. <laughs> Poor man. 
God help him. Uh, if you tell them to live a spiritual life, they will answer that this is the only way of life they know. Of course, I'm spiritual. What are you talking about? How could you question them? That they've already arrived. They don't see anything in their life that needs changing. They're great Christians. We see this a lot in immoralism, in the moralistic uh, realm of Christianity, where they say, what does it mean to be a Christian? Well, to be a good person. And I'm a good person. Therefore, I've arrived. I don't need to listen to your talks. I don't need to go to your church services. I don't need to read the scriptures. I don't need to read the Bible saints because I'm a good person. Isn't that what it's all about anyway, to be a good person? That person is super lukewarm and deluded. They don't know the first thing about Christ. If Christ came to simply teach us the law, he didn't and shouldn't have come. Wasted his time. We don't need him to teach us the law and be good people. Obviously, salvation is not to be a good person only. You can't be a saint if you're not a good person in the sense of keeping and struggling to keep the moral law. But if you think you've arrived because you didn't kill somebody and didn't commit adultery and didn't lie yesterday, you are far from the kingdom of God. Far, far from the kingdom of God. These unfortunate people are filled with egotism and does not allow a single ray, Elder Athanasius says, does not allow a single ray of God's grace to penetrate and work change within them. They are self-satisfied. They're lukewarm. They're unable and incapable of increasing their spiritual thermometer even by one degree, and yet they are under the impression that they are the best specimen humanity has to offer and the best of Christians, according to Elder Athanasius. The paradoxical announcement of the Lord tells them, you are not warm or cold, you are not hot or cold. You are lukewarm. You are better off cold. This is a paradox. This is a paradox. Why would the Lord want us cold rather than lukewarm? If you're on the spectrum, you would think, well, hot, lukewarm, cold. Better in the middle, isn't it? Aren't you closer to the warmth? Wouldn't, wouldn't that make more sense? And isn't that exactly how our whole church's Pimantiki is? Appeal to the masses of the Christians. Have them as the standard and criteria. Make sure dumb everything down so that no one walks away. This is the this is the ninety percent of the spiritual guidance and the criteria followed by most Orthodox pastors today is how do I appeal to and appease and keep the majority happy? And it's a destruction for all involved. It is the lukewarm pimentiki, this pastoral uh, work, right? Pimentiki is the Greek term for pastoral work of the, of the priest. That, if that's the criteria, and it is very much so in my experience, in, in bishops, from the bishops on down, did you drive people away? You are a terrible pastor, but the Lord drove people away. Have you not read the gospel? It depends. Why did they walk away? Not just if they walked away, but many walked away from the Lord. Many said this is a hard saying. Many said that this man is... It's talking about cannibalism, he's crazy. He's talking about the cross, he's talking about people, you're trying to kill me. How many times in the gospel did we hear him say things that people said, this is crazy, this is a hard saying, this is too much. And he didn't stop them from walking away, he let them go. So true pastoral work, true Christian preaching and teaching and guiding is going to be guiding us from lukewarmness to, to, to warmth or better cold better cold which means what walk away if you if you so choose here's the gospel here's the truth you don't like it you're free to go you're free to go folks choose as you want you are free that's the way the church should be folks this is this is the biggest problem of the day it's called secularism the spirit of antichrist D dumb down minimalism and the people who are cold who want to find Christ are not attracted to that. The lukewarm like that. Ooh, that's nice. I can just be in both worlds. I can. It's like sitting in a lukewarm bath, right? No, not too hot, not too cold. Just sit here and blah blah blah. That's the that's the that's our life. And then we go to the grave and God help us. This is not the cross of Christ preaching the cross of Christ that the apostle talks about. So this is a paradoxical declaration. And it's strange why he wants people cold rather than lukewarm. But experience and even psychology is clearly showing that man 
who is cold, the man who is cold spiritually, is able to repent, whereas the lukewarm one does not. Of what? I'm a good Christian, right? How can be? How can? I, what I need to repent for? I'm a good Christian. I'm just, you know, keeping status quo. And that's what you should. This man's a threat to us over here. He's telling us we need to repent and leave everything behind and follow him. This is a this is a a threat to the status quo. That's the spirit of the world. That's what part of what the spirit of the world that killed, that crucified our Lord. The status quo, right? They say better to die for the Israel. Didn't they say that right? Keep the status quo. He's rocking the boat. He's a threat to our stability. He's a threat to our power. He's a threat to our authority. This is the problem. And the spirit, the lukewarm spirit, is what brings about this kind of rejection of the cross. And there's no repentance for those people. Look at the thief on the cross, the, the elder says. You had two thieves on the cross. Both of them were cold. Right? Both were rejecting Christ. Both were mocking him, it says. Both of them had mocked the Lord in the beginning. What happened? One was transformed. Went from cursing to praising and praying to. And why? Because even on the cross, the Lord was forgiving his enemies. Even on the cross, he was showing love. Even on the cross, he was not clearly a simple human being. He saw that this man was actually the god man because what he was seeing could not be a human only event but it had to be a divine humanity and he believed and he confessed and his soul was lifted up a lukewarm person does not have that kind of abrupt and dynamic repentance does not happen for the lukewarm so he does not budge but he rests on his laurels and he thinks he's arrived and he thinks very highly of himself. And this is a grave, grave danger. Grave danger. And then when temptations come to such people, they say, why, Lord? Whereas if temptations come to a struggler who is searching for truth but maybe has grown cold because he has been scandalized and he's walked away and he's searching. For instance, many people here in this wasteland of the West are searching for true Christianity and true Christ. And they walk away from that which is presented to them. They're not, they're very cold toward Christ, but yet they're searching for the truth. And they wake up if given the opportunity, if they see Christ crucified. Right? That's the key. That's the truth. They see the truth in all its glory. So we have that. Um, It says, the cold man, according to St. Andrew Casaria, the cold man has never tasted the fruit of faith. At some point, he tastes something. He tastes the faith, and immediately he says, this is exactly what I was looking for, and he becomes warm. And this is why, how do people end up becoming lukewarm? That's a good question, isn't it? Because maybe we started out very zealous. There are many who come into orthodoxy very zealous today. And then all of a sudden, two, three years later, you're wondering what happened to them. Some of them walk away from the church entirely. They apostatize. This is something that, uh, that I've been, has been remarked to me re recently, the last five to ten years, which I don't remember in the 1990s hearing much about. The converts in the 90s, by and large, there was one lady I remember who, who was almost immediately an apostate. But by and large, you did not hear such things. Whereas today, in the last 10 years, you hear people coming and going. And I think there's a variety of reasons which we can't get into tonight. But what makes somebody go from zealous and hot to lukewarm? And that might be a question of cat poor catechism and all the rest or scandal. But it is something that we're all in, we're in this state, the vast majority of us. And we're in this lukewarmness. And it's, it's a gradual process, and it comes in because we have grown lax in our spiritual life. We've grown lax in our kanona, our prayer rule. We've grown lax in the ascetic struggle, the daily grind, the program, 
We've grown lax in keeping the principles, the akrivia. We've grown lax in terms of loving the truth and, 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 and going deeper in the truth. It's a constant struggle to remain hot, to remain at least full of the spiritual warmth of the Holy Spirit. It's a constant struggle. If you let up and you start to look around you, as opposed to up eschatologically toward heaven, if you start to look left and right, and you compare yourself to those other people who may be further behind or further ahead of you, then you can easily start to say, wait, I don't need to struggle so hard. Look, so-and-so, look at the priest so-and-so, look at the bishop so-and-so, who's a scandal. Some gossip, some scandal comes in. And we end up justifying ourselves on the basis of the sins of others. In fact, there are many people who say, I don't need to go to church. Look, I mean, what's the point? Go to church, there are all these sinners in there. They're always sinning. They're always, they're pathetic. They're not cool. What's the point? I don't get it. Why do I need to do that? Right? So they're, they're not looking to Christ. As the same person who came to, came to me years ago and said to me, I don't need to go for the hypocrites. My response is, well, I don't go for the hypocrites. I'm one of them. But anyway, I go for Christ. And so if you're not going for Christ, then you're in danger and on the path to walk away and to start to keep things externally. And that's called lukewarm. That's the lukewarmness. When you're doing things for externals. And you could be this, you could be somebody who's super strict, zealot in the sense of the externals. Right? You could be somebody who's strict and, and, and zealous in terms of the externals. And, and you could, in, de- in fact, be uh, lukewarm. How does, that, how does that work? You can have lukewarmness and strictness in terms of the externals, and yet it's possible. It's very possible. And so the, 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 those who've made orthodoxy into a kind of ideolo- ideology, who've become super zealots for the externals or for, the, for certain uh, secondary aspects, they could still be super lukewarm in terms of their internal life and they could be focused on the externals. And and they're not far from that one, the same person who uses the, the church as a coffee shop and to meet his friends. Right? They have different, they have different likes and dislikes, they have different interests. They could be super conservative politically, they could be zealots for the monarchy. I don't know what else. There's all kinds of interests of, of this world that they could be, and they're good interests, they're certainly better than the coffee house and the gossip. And yet, in terms of internal regeneration, in terms of purification. In terms of making progress in the inner life and in the kingdom, they're not much different. They're they're they're, they're ignorant of themselves. So this is this is the key here. To get out of the lukewarmness, we've got to grow in self knowledge, right? And we've got to stop focusing on the negative things in the church. This is one of the things that the lukewarm do. They justify themselves. They look around. They look at all the negatives. Uh, and they say, well, who is faithful? And there's been quite a few people who've written me uh, over the whole period of COVIDism. And what COVIDism did is it woke a lot of people up and it put a lot of other people to sleep, depending on their dis- disposition. It wasn't really anything new. All it did was make uh, apparent what we had inside us. It, it reminded me, today I was sitting there talking to a, a priest there outside the, uh, the, the ke- keli of Father Maximus, we were talking about the problem in the church today, as as priests usually do when they get together, because they're like doctors talking about the various diseases and how what are we going to do, how we're going to live. And it struck me the analogy of what how uh, what happened in COVIDism is not much different than what happened what happens in somebody who has a sickness like cancer. So people, the doctors, I'm not a doctor, but what I understand is that we all have we're all potentially cancerous. Right? We all have the potential, depending on our lifestyle and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the cells and all kinds of things that happen internally, and also the anxiety, lots of anxiety. People get sick from anxiety and not having faith, not having trust, not having peace. Right, All of that contributes to, to long-term sickness. That manifests itself. This cancer becomes manifest and starts to, starts to wake up and live within us. And then it becomes apparent that we have cancer. It was always in it, but now it becomes apparent. That's kind of what happened 
with COVIDism. We have a cancer that was in us that had pre-existed COVIDism, but now it's very apparent. Secularism, worldliness, fear, not having trust in God. That became very apparent when this sickness, uh, physical, supposed sickness of the body and all that, that they were presenting. I mean, what exactly was the debate, but you know, there was a lot of lying going on as to the degree of what, what was really happening uh, around the sickness, around the virus. But in terms of that, that whole dynamic of physical sickness brought about the manifestation of a spiritual sickness, a cancer that's in us. And so if you're constantly uh, uh, thinking and, and focusing on the negative things of the church, the apostasy during COVID, the apostasy of ecumenism, uh, the, 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 the sorry state of secular, secularized Christianity. Well, that's not, that's a bad sign, right? That's not, a, you cannot do that and, and make progress in the spiritual life. You cannot sit there and be fixated on the negatives, right? And that ends up undermining your spiritual struggle. It'll, it'll end up secretly becoming a justification for our own pathetic worldliness. And that's sometimes why we do it anyway. We focus on the negatives to justify our own patheticness. We're not focused on ourselves. We're not struggling for self-knowledge. And we're poisoning ourselves with the scandals and the adverse uh, effects of, of the world and the spirit of the world on the people of God. And that's, that's a bad sign for us. Uh, it destroys the hope. It withers the zeal. And then we say, as Elder Nathanasius says, he said, well, if we'd only have the Lord next to us, if we only have the Lord next to us, and yet we do have the Lord next to us. Of course we have the Lord. He's always present in the church, and he's waiting for us to repent. Uh, we, we can become free of our disillusionment immediately, like the thief on the cross, if we're not lukewarm, if we're not justifying ourselves, if we're not indifferent to truth, right? All these things. Uh, so the Bishop of Laodicea needed to be brought back to reality. And here comes the Lord with the strict love and the harsh words and says, look, you're lukewarm, you're deluded, you got a, you got a serious spiritual uh, deliberate, uh, deliberation. And you say, I'm rich and have become wealthy and you have need of nothing, but this is a sign of your absolute poverty. Uh, you've allowed the arrogance of the world, of the, the wealth of that city, uh, to, to dilute you into thinking that you have need of nothing. Uh, and that is really a wretchedness, a miserable, poor, blinded nakedness. That's what he says. Something here. Sorry about that. Uh, some bell or something was ringing over there. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so you are poor, miserable, blind, and naked. He says to the bishop. And he says, how will I stand? This is what we need to do. The questions we need to ask now, right? We need to come to self-knowledge. This is what we need to do. We need to come to self-knowledge. And he says, how will I stand in front of you, O Lord? And you in front of me. And even more important, how will we stand before the Lord? This is the question we should be asking ourselves constantly. If we want to grow in self-knowledge and get loosened from the lukewarmness, we need to constantly ask ourselves, how will we stand before the Lord? Not before the people. How will I look? What will people think? This is, a, this is a terrible, terrible spiritual state to be in. What will people say? Who cares what people say? The Lord, what does he say? What does the Lord say? And that's what should matter more to us than anything. And then maybe our true self will become apparent. And this is the great goal of all of us should be to come to self-knowledge. Who we truly are. Really see ourselves. 
the roll back all the idols that we've created about ourselves, the ideas that we 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 treasure about ourselves, right? So we should run to discover ourselves with the Lord before the Lord reveals us on the last day, the judgment seat, right? Let's reveal, let's reveal ourselves in confession to the Lord and therefore have him open our eyes to reveal who we really are. Come to self-knowledge. You got to be going to confession. You got to have a spiritual father. You got to have constantly being, you know, if you're a, a newcomer to the struggle, you've got to have a little booklet, write down your sins, write down your falls, write down your thoughts. This is very important if you're going to make progress in spiritual life to come to self-knowledge. Who am I? Who am I? And this is what the Lord is doing now with the Bishop of Laodicea. He's bringing him to self-knowledge and to repentance. Indeed, such a statement that I have need of nothing is the statement of a fool. It's the psychology of the foolish, the selfish, the antisocial person. I don't need him. I don't need anybody. I don't need anything, right? Uh, and Elder Athanasius says, yeah, yeah, when, you're, when you get some meat wedged in your throat and you're choking, you're going to say you need the guy next to you. Just to give you one example, we need one another. So we need to come, we need to come to spiritual, take spiritual inventory, self-inventory. How often do we do that? Do we do that on a daily basis? Do we do that on a weekly basis? Do we go to confession often? Are we prepared when we go to confession? Do we prepare ourselves to confession the night before? Or do we compare, prepare ourselves to confession every day, every week? And then when we finally go, whatever it is, weekly or monthly or whatever it is, we're ready to actually say, here I am. This is who I am. I actually ended up in the last month uh, judging my neighbor 47 times that I remember. I actually uh, missed my prayer rule uh, in the last month 20 times. So I actually only ended up doing my full prayer rule 10 out of the 20 or 30 days. You know, these are the kind of things we have to be mindful of, watchful over, write it down, look it in the face, take it to the confessor, take it to the Lord, submit it and say, that's who I am. I'm pathetic. I'm wretched. I'm poor. I'm naked. That's the stance of someone who's coming to himself, who's growing in self-knowledge, who's making progress in the spiritual life. You cannot come to knowledge of God. You will have an idol created in your head, as many, many people do. They worship that which they think or want to be uh, uh, Christ. They want Christ to be in this image or to be like this. They ignore the hard sayings. They have, we've created a, a, a Christ who doesn't exist in reality. Many Christians have. Right? They live in a delusion of thinking that, the Christ that I like, I have a, I have a leftist progressive Christ, or I have a, a gun-toting a militaristic Christ, or whatever it is that that, 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 that attracts them in this world, and they, they, they stick Christ on next to it and say, well, that's my Christ. Instead of saying, I, have, I'm, I am naked, poor, come to self-knowledge, and then turn to Christ and say, in my total poverty and blindness, open my mind. Open my mind. Help me to see reality as it is right come to self understanding we have to review ourselves constantly so some of the questions that the elder says am i warm do i feel the burning of the holy spirit within me if you don't feel warmth at the holy spirit you don't feel the presence of the holy spirit you probably don't have much of the holy spirit these things are not you know we don't live a christian life and and have and and are completely dead to anything. A, a cold stone heart. We don't cry for those who are, who are miserable. We don't weep for the delusion of the world. We don't have pain of heart for our neighbor. If, if that's the reality, and the, we live in our head and our heart is stone cold and we're, we have a disconnect here. And we have not begun to pray. We've not begun to go deep. He says... Do I have spiritual impulses and inclinations? Am I inclined to think and see and feel in the spiritual realm to understand the, the, the workings of the Holy Spirit? Do I get excited and do I feel God's presence in different areas of my life? Are there times when we feel such joy and, and we're in the middle of the divine services or in the middle of our prayer rule or that we're, we're talking to some 
somebody who's a spiritual man, or we're reading the life of a saint, and we just bubble up with joy and 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 we say glory to God. We say thank God. Do we have any of that? Do we have any of that? Is that happening in the in the inner life? Do I weep and mourn for the bad things that exist within the church? When we hear about these scandals, when we hear about people falling into sin, people falling from grace, when we, when we, when we, when we hear about and see the, the betrayal of orthodoxy and ecumenism or the, the fall from, from orthodox phronema during COVIDism, what is our response? Do we sit in self-righteousness and hypocrisy and Pharisaism and condemn everybody? Or do we have pain of heart? And say, Lord, have mercy. What is going on? God, help us. Save us. Have mercy on us. We fall on our knees in our prayer corner and we say, God, help us. Help the people. Help the bishops. Help the faithful. What do we do? Is the flame of missionary work burning within me like it was burning within the Bishop of Philadelphia who received praise from the Lord? Do we have that burning desire for people to know about Christ, for people to come to the church? Do we have that? Am I a person of faith and boldness and not a child who draws back, as St. Paul says? And St. Paul said, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and keep their souls. If we shrink back from the struggle, from the cross, let me give you an example. How many faithful Christians ended up taking the poison stick? even though they did not want to. They realized this is not God's will, but they didn't want to lose their job. They didn't want to lose their schooling. They didn't want to lose whatever. And if you're one of those, or you know somebody who was and is, there's only one path forward. Repent. You say, well, repent for taking... Actually, yes. That's what spiritual fathers will tell you who are on the narrow path, I believe. Because it's not, there's nothing indifferent in the spiritual life. Oh, it doesn't, it's not a spiritual question. Of course it's a spiritual question. Oh, it doesn't matter. It can't, it, it, it's regardless that they used uh, cells from initially, you know, tested the things on cells from aborted babies. It's irrelevant. No, it's not. Oh, it doesn't matter that, that actually it distorts things in, internally and, and, it, and it brings about all kinds of bad side effects like myocarditis and all these things. And people are dying from it. All of this is a sign that God's will was not there and we acquiesced. And our conscience told us, many of us, don't do it. Trust. And we went ahead with it anyway. We need to repent. We need to repent of many things. Missing the mark, sin, is not so narrow as you think. It's not just the Ten Commandments, folks. It's not just, I did a bad thing, I was angry. There's, missing the mark is... Very broad, and it, it takes in many things. And the the more you grow in the spiritual life, the more sensitive you become to just how minute things can be in in regards to the will of God. So if you don't do the will of God, you are missing the mark, and you are sinning. You're falling away from what God wants from you. And there are many ways we do that. It's not so narrow and so you know moralistic. People think of, in terms of the will of God is that I be a good person, and if I'm a good person, then and nothing else matters. This is not the spiritual life. Again, this is not a spiritual life you're talking about. This is a moralistic approach to uh, Christ and the spiritual life. He came to give us the Holy Spirit. He gave. He came to give us Pentecost. Not once, but every time in every church that the Spirit of God descends in the divine liturgy. At every baptism, at every chrismation, at every ordination, it's Pentecost. The constant, constant presence of the Holy Spirit, that's the spiritual life. It's not sufficient to just be a good person, to do the good things, to do externals. That's not, that's a lukewarm. And what happens to lukewarm? They get spit out of the Lord's mouth. God help us. God help us all to have self-knowledge and to see where we are in regards to this whole question of being lukewarm. The elder asks, is it possible that I'm cold? Another question we should ask ourselves. Am I cold? And how am I cold? In what ways am I cold? As St. Aretha says, is, is it possible that I'm altogether cut off from the energy of the Holy Spirit? We have to ask that question. Even if we're going to church, because our sins and our ignorances and our arrogance and our pride and our lukewarmness can be a 
obstacle to the free flowing of the energy of the divine spirit that comes in and through the mysteries. We can absolutely erupt a wall, a wall of, uh, uh, what are the elders said, a wall of China, right? That's the kind of wall. It's a massive wall that we erupt, erect and block the free and er the flowing energy of the grace of God, love of God in our hearts. Is it possible that I've become a mobile refrigerator <laughs> of faith in life? Is it possible that I've reached the point of being cruel, harsh, emotionless, merciless, uncaring, antisocial, individualistic, ooh, hardened, unloving, tearless, mm, mm, having a heart of stone? Is it possible? That's, that's me. Yes, it is. It's definitely possible. And worse yet, is it possible that I took a few categories from those things that refer to being hot and a few categories from those that refer to being cold? And I've mixed them all together, thus having the hot qualities become lukewarm. And finally ending up being neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm. Of course, this means that I will end up being nothing. So the Lord, in, in talking in his love and rebuking this bishop, desiring his return and his zeal again, which again is applicable to all of us today, as we are extremely wealthy and affluent in our day and age and have ease constantly. And that's why you hear so much complaining, by the way. Why do people complain all the time, have bad thoughts and, be, and you know, call up? And, because we're spoiled. We're spoiled rotten. He says, do you know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? Oh, my goodness. We have to be careful here because we can go to the other extreme and become egotists from below, as I say. This is my way of, of expre expressing this inferiority complexes. So oh, poor me, poor me. I'm nobody. I'm, no, I'm nothing. Nobody loves me. Nobody understands me. Nobody supports me. You don't like me. You don't listen to me all day long. That's a kind of egotism where we don't properly stand before God. Like, Somebody who is an egotist will take these words or live this in a way that is faithless, trustless. He doesn't understand that, yes, of course we're weak, of course we're pathetic, of course we're naked, of course we're blind. That's all of us. And yet, God doesn't want us to be that way. God doesn't desire that. He's come to restore us. He's come to re renew us. And if I can trust him, then even though I bring all that to the table, he will change me he will transform me he will bring me to a new man a new creation in him so yes we're going to say and we're going to understand how insignificant we are and unimportant we are at the same time we're going to say that uh, god wants us to come and be among the first he wants us to sit on the thrones of israel and be with the apostles and be on our on his right side and so having him as our advocate we take courage and we struggle when you do it on our own nobody can force us into this by the way your parents you have children you should have learned the lesson or you will learn it quickly that you can't force them to be virtuous you can't force them to believe you can't force them to do anything good you can only show them good examples and encourage them on the path they have to want it we all have to want it on our own we have to come and say i want to come and see and smell the stench of my soul i want to go through that process and get it all out i want to see myself so we need to pray lord humble me exceedingly you say oh guys that's a that's a scary prayer can i really say that extreme humility that's the, that's the example the Lord gave us. That's who our Lord is. Extreme humility on the cross. That's who our Lord is. And he says, pick, pick up that cross and follow me. That's what I'm showing you, what I want you to do too. God, give us extreme humility. Help us to see ourselves fully and understand how naked, poor, blind, and miserable we really are. And yet, do not abandon us. If we don't 
if we don't assert ourselves, we don't think we're anything, then Christ will come and begin to make us into something. It's not I, who, but Christ who lives in me, the Apostle Paul says. It's very interesting to note, Elder Athanasius notes, and I didn't even, never really thought about this until preparing for this class tonight, and that is that it's from lukewarm water that you end up vomiting. That's what induces vomiting when you drink lukewarm water, not hot or cold. So I thought that was very interesting. And the term, the phrase there. Everything in scripture is so deep and profound, even on that kind of level. So the kind of Christian we want to become is the one who sells everything for that pearl of great price. The one who wants to sell everything for that, that uh, field in which the treasure is hidden, and that is the heart, right? Uh, it's for Christ who is the precious pearl. He's the white garment. He's the one, the wealth that we want to obtain. Everything is for his benefit and for our communion with him. And the Lord says in the parable of the wedding banquet, he says, friend, how did you enter here? How did you enter without having a wedding garment? How does a Christian have a wedding garment? He puts on Christ in baptism, chrismation, communion. He doesn't throw him off again through apostasy. He doesn't throw him off again through worldliness. He doesn't throw him off again choosing sin and the way of the world. But he, he goes deeper into that kingdom which has now been given to him. The Lord says, I see your, your, your bridal, uh, no, I'm sorry, we see, we chant, I see your bridal chamber, my Savior, in its full splendor, and I do not have a wedding garment to enter the room, right? I do not have a garment, meaning I see your kingdom, the bridal chamber of Christ is the kingdom. I want to enter into that bridal chamber of Christ, I want to enter into the communion with Christ. That is the kingdom of God, he is the kingdom of God, Christ himself is the kingdom of God. But I don't have a wedding garment. I have not been clothed with you. I had in the baptism, I put on Christ. But what happens? We bury him under all of our sin, arrogance, pride, indifference, lack of struggle, lack of love, lack of crucifixion. That's what happens. And then we don't, the garment is not there. We don't see the garment. It's not shiny. It's, not, it's no longer apparent to our sin. Christ is the light of the world, and he who has this light, as St. John the Evangelist says, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He means that the eyes of the whole healthy soul are wide open. Remember, in the, in, in, we're talking about here um, to anoint your eyes that you may see. Right, That's what the Lord says to the bishop, to anoint your eyes that you may see. Christ truly is I solve for spiritual vision. When you take Holy Scripture in your hands, you will say, what do I see? I see things that I could never have seen before. How many of us read Holy Scripture on a daily basis? I struggle more and more. I, I'll be honest with you. I got so many things going on right now. This conference, these lectures, my family, all kinds of things going on, constantly demanding my attention that I'm struggling to be faithful, to read and, and pour over the scriptures. So God help all of us, including, and first of all, myself, to go deeper. But when you read scripture, he says, you'll say, what do I see? I see the things I never could have seen before. Right? It's because of the eye drops, the solve that you use to remove the scales from your eyes. Christ came and he opened your eyes. So he says, I am the solve to anoint your eyes that you may see. And he says, those whom I love, I reprove and chasten. Those whom I love, I reprove and chasten. Very important. Revelation 3.19. St. Andrew of Caesarea says, what philanthropy, what love of man. What love of man here. Reproof is mixed with so much goodness at the same time. So this harshness is far from being unloving. It's actually expression of love. We could talk all night about the love so-called of this world today. 
how much fakery and how much superficialness there is in the love of that people talk about today. It's without the cross, it's without sacrifice, and therefore it's not love at all. It's a counterfeit love that is going on in the world today. The, the, supposedly to love your neighbor is to leave them in delusion. To love your neighbor is to ignore their spiritual benefit, is not to speak the truth to them. That's to, to love them. Uh, and love in the humanistic, superficial, worldly sense, that we, that we are essentially put aside truth in the name of love. And of course, what kind of love that is, it's not the love of God. It's not the love that comes from God. Uh, this is true and pure love that we see here. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. That's the true love. That's the true love of our Lord. It's not like the love that you have for your children, the elder says. He's talking to us, all of us who are married, have children. He says, it's not like the love you had for your children. Such unhealthy love sends them to hell because it makes you not want to see their faults so that you fail to correct them. Far from love when you go, don't worry, it doesn't matter. Okay, I'm indifferent. Go back to your work. That actually is selfishness on your part. It's actually a lack of true love because correction and giving them in a, in a serious and strict manner the truth is the greatest uh, benefit that you can give to your children. You caress them, he says. You overlook their passions, their sinfulness, their missteps, and you justify them. This sort of love sends people to hell. Christ truly loves, but his love is intertwined with discipline, a love that stabilizes and prepares people for the kingdom of God. You can, see, you can see immediately and very clearly how far we are from true love and from the kingdom of God when this whole world is enmeshed in, the, in this self-love, past as love, uh, that does not want to discipline, does not want discipline at all in our lives. No discipline, please. If we can have anarchy and total laxity, that would be best. If I can just sit on my bed and, and, and lose myself on the internet and not care about anyone or anything, because I don't have enough love for my neighbor, that would be great. People would be thrilled, right? Let's create that kind of society where everybody's uh, uh, on their own, in their own world, and not caring about God or their fellow man. Reproof and discipline are the two means of God's correction and love for man. The Word of God says in Hebrews 12, 4 to 11, what does the Apostle Paul say? In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Wow. Wow. That's, that's, that's a powerful uh, line right there for all of us. In your struggle, you who, oh, I struggle, I struggle, I struggle, right? In your struggle against sin, not much of a struggle, let's be honest. We don't really struggle that hard. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. What do the ascetics say? Shed blood, receive the spirit. That's the that's the gospel. And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not highly re, uh, regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor lose courage when you are punished by him. For the Lord disciplines him whom he loves. The Lord disciplines him whom he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have not, that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Well, that was just, of course, in the ancient world, it's a given. What son is there that his father is not disciplined? Of course, the father's going to discipline his son. But indeed, in our day and age, discipline is far and far uh, between. It's hard to find. If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Wow. No discipline, no sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. Sign of the end times when the children don't respect their parents. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? 
and saying, if you do it on, you know what a father is, he disciplines, and you accept the discipline of your father, right? Right. Everybody says, of course. Well, how much more now for the father of lights, the father who gives eternal life? For they disciplined us for a short time at their pleasure, the fathers. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness forever. How much more then should we accept his discipline? So all of you who go to church and complain that the priest is too harsh, that the priest is too strict, that the church is too strict, they need to lighten up on the fast, they need to talk more about love, love, love. All of you, you don't want to have a true father, apparently, according to the Apostle Paul. Because then you that's the sign of a true father, is that he's going to discipline you. He's going to teach you the truth. We all need it. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. After, however, later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So the fact that we don't want discipline is a way of saying we don't want righteousness. Hmm. That's a hard one to hear. I don't want to be rebuked by my spiritual father. I don't want to hear a hard word, a hard saying. You don't want righteousness. You say you want it righteous, but you don't really want it. You don't want to suffer for it. You don't want to humble yourself for it. You don't want to embrace it. So God is uh, just like a father who disciplines. He is the one who disciplines those who belong to him. And he only disciplines those who belong to him. Listen to this one. This is very important. Just like you as a father, or I as a father, are going to discipline who? Who am I going to discipline? Am I going to discipline the neighbor's children? Am I going to discipline the guy across the street's children? No. I'm going to discipline my children. Who does God discipline? His children. You say, well, all of humanity is his children. No, not in the same way. To be a son of God by grace, by adoption, through baptism in the Spirit, is not all of humanity. So we're talking about True spiritual sonship. In other words, we're made, we're restored to the image, and we're on the path of restoring entirely the likeness. That's the ones who are referred to here. He only chastises the children that he accepts as his own. Remember, he says, I don't pray for the world, but I pray for those you've given me in his high priestly prayer. There is this side of things. Of course, he wants the salvation of all men and come to the knowledge of the truth. But his children, his sons, the ones he disciplines, are those who are in the household, who are in his house, right? Who live in him. And so we come to the Desert Father saying, where they say, oh my gosh, I don't have any troubles. I don't have any discipline. In other words, I don't have any temptations. God has abandoned me. God has abandoned me. Because I have no troubles, no disciplines. Because if God, God's going to discipline me if I'm his son, I'm going to have trouble, I'm going to have temptations, I'm going to have struggles, because that's what a good father will do to a son. He'll give him that discipline. And the son will say, yes, father, let it be blessed, father. According to your word, father, right? If you endure chastening, chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? This is to our great benefit so that we can become partakers of his holiness. So he's not only disciplining us to make us good citizens, to good children, have a good name for the for the household. No, 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 no. Why, why did he come and die for us? Why does he send his pedagogical lessons to us? For what purpose? Theosis and nothing less. To become gods by grace and nothing less. To participate in his holiness and nothing less. Everything he does, everything he allows in your life, all the temptations he, he allows you to suffer, are for the perfection of the saints, for the partake, for being a partaker of divine nature, according to the Apostle Paul. In other words, holiness. In other words, the grace of God. To make us gods by grace. All of it is for that purpose in your life. So that we can become, again, partakers, participants. Methixi in Greek. It's very powerful in Greek. Methixi. It's like, it's like you know being drunk, as it were. That's not really, that's more modern Greek. But anyway, being participants in the divine energies, the divine grace, and one with God. 
So he turns and he says, be zealous and repent, okay? Yes, I'm going to discipline you. Yes, I'm going to chasten you because I love you. But what are you going to do? Be zealous and repent. That's our job. That's all we're doing. All our life is repentance, 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 repentance. What we do? What do we off? What do we have to offer God except our repentance, our return, our reorientation again and again and again? It's not an action in the church. We say again and again, let us pray to the Lord. Again and again, we're going to turn back. We fell, we get up, we turn back. We fell, we get up, we turn back. That's the faithful Christian, the Son of God. That's what he does, and he doesn't argue. He doesn't complain about that. He says, thank God I have another day to do that, to repent, to reorient. I have another day. Thank God. I have one more day to repent. That's what St. Sisoya said. So in this discipline, same time, we have his great love. He says, be zealous and repent. And you see here, all together, in one, one movement, we have this rarely found in our life and in Scripture, this chastening and this great tenderness at the same time. The judge now pulls back and friend appears. The judge pulls back and the friend appears. That's how it is. The pedagogy of the Lord is continuing like this. And that's how we should be as pedagogues. By the way, in our family, in our with our children, we should have that strictness when called for, and we should pull back and be a friend who's there by their side also when necessary, when when in need. God is saying at the door, he's constantly knocking. He says, I stand knocking at the door. I keep knocking. Look at that. People say, where's God? He's knocking. People say, is there any hope for anybody? Any hope for my friends, my neighbors, my brother, my sister, my father, my uh, husband who doesn't come to church? Is there any hope? He's knocking continually. Of course there's hope. He's doing more for that soul than you could possibly imagine, ever want, ever, ever expect. The problem is not with God. The problem is with us. But the prayer of a righteous availeth much. So we need to pray fervently. He is doing his work. We're praying fervently. And together, the love of God and man, united in Christ, is what transforms this world and can bring many people to out of the lukewarmness and into the, into the light, into the warmth of the Holy Spirit. But he does not do it in a way that's forceful. He does not push himself on people. He does not threaten him, people. It is not, it's not like a political party who's trying to corral you into getting, getting his vote, uh, the vote for him. None of that. In the archondas in Greek, right? He's a no, he's noble. In Philotimos, he has great love and sacrifice for his people. He does not come with force. His presence, according to St. Andrew of Caesarea, my presence is without force. My presence, the presence of God is without force. What do we see in the prophet Elias? The still small voice. That's how the Lord comes to us. The proud don't see him. Why? Because they're not looking for the still, still, still small voice. They want the thunder. Why didn't God wake me up? Because you didn't want to be woken up, friend. You got to want. And you say, well, I don't want. Then you got to want to want. Start there. Start wherever you have to. Just start. He's knocking. He's knocking, he's knocking, he's knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and I will make my abode, abode in him. Isn't that amazing? He will make his abode in us? Wow. So those who open their heart to Jesus Christ, those who have a good disposition, those who seek the truth and love the truth and want to live for the truth, will have the reward. What's the reward? Christ. I will enter into him, and I will dine with him, and he with me, it says here in, in the book of Revelation. Amazing. How very, very, very close the Lord wants to be with us, closer than ourselves. He's close. If you're a baptized, chrismated, communing human being, made an image like this, and making, made an image and, and restored the image and on the path to the likeness, if you're in that struggle, you can be assured that Christ is closer to you than you are to yourself. He knows you better, of course. 
And the process now is for that whole knowledge and presence to be revealed, to be revealed through our good disposition and our love and our struggle and our sacrifice. That opens the door to the kingdom which is within. So we're actually shut out from the kingdom. We're sort of shut out from ourselves. We don't have self-knowledge. That's what it means you shut out of the kingdom. We don't know ourselves. We don't know who God is. That's when you're outside the kingdom. If you walk in this world and you think you're somebody and you don't realize that you are what? What are you? Let's go back a minute. What did he say we are? Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Mm. That's who we are. If you don't know that, then you are actually locked out of the kingdom. He wants to be so very close to us. He wants to live in the house of our heart. He wants us to be with the, in the banquet of the kingdom of God, then and now. What's, where do we go now for that? The divine liturgy. The divine liturgy is the banquet of the kingdom of God in this world. It's the great mystery in which we enter in to the kingdom now in this world. The word of God himself said, he who eats my flesh stays in me and I in him. And I will come in and dine with him and he with me. You see how it's so instructive, that passage about the Lord speaking to his disciples and saying to them, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they say, whoa, that's a hard saying. That's a hard saying. There are many hard sayings. And people walk away all the time and he lets them go. But that's that hard saying was intentional. Because it ha you had to accept that hard saying to be his disciple. And then therefore, when you do that, you humble yourself. You come to self-knowledge. Who am I? Peter says, uh, where are we going to go? You have the words of life. I am nothing. I am naked. I'm poor. I'm wretched. You have the words of life, Lord. Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter responded when he said, eat my flesh. My and what, what is that? Why? Because that's how you're going to enter the kingdom within. That's how the kingdom of God is going to manifest within you. When you eat my flesh and drink my blood and you trust me. And you say, uh, uh, where are we going to go? You have the words of life. You Oh, Lord, that simplicity, that love is the key, the key to open the kingdom. It's also the great banquet of God's kingdom in the age to come, now and forever under the ages of ages. Now and forever under the ages of ages, the kingdom to come, the eternal vision of the person of Jesus Christ. This is the post-judgment eternal life of those who are in him now in the kingdom of God within, which is manifest and participated in most excellently in the divine liturgy so now we come to the conclusion of the epistle in which he says he who conquers i will grant him to sit with me on my throne think about that spiritually what does that mean sit with me on my throne what is that the one who's conquered all the passions and all the devils and all the death that's the kingdom. That's the king who sits on the throne. So if you're going to sit with him on his throne, you're going to be one who has conquered, who's victorious over the passions, over the devil, over the over death, over the fear of death. He was, he's going to sit up with me on my throne as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Oh, that's amazing. Look about what he's giving us. What is he giving us? mind-blowing to think on what Christ is giving us and who he is. So the victorious one is the one who defeats the three things of the world, uh, the th three things which are obstacles to the world, the passions, his own passions, and the devil. Those are the three enemies that have to be defeated. It means to sit with Christ on the eternal throne of his glory. That's theosis, that's glorification in Christ, right? His glory, and the blessedness during the absolute and final triumph of Christ, the tri final triumph of the faithful as well. That's what it means to be victorious. And he says, so, I will grant him to do this, this, and this. If he is victorious, I will grant him this. And with this, we end the first part of the book of Revelation. We've come to the first end of the first part of the book of Revelation. Uh, this vision of Jesus Christ, the, the, the epistles to all the churches, which is really to the entire church and to each one of us and all the local churches to the last day. And how much, again, this particular epistle is, is adequate for all of us new first world Western 
converts to orthodoxy lord have mercy we are the church of uh laodicea on steroids today the wealth and the arrogance of contemporary man and so this is the first section in which the pedagogue the great pedagogue the great initiator into the mystery the lord comes and says to his disciples here's what you need to do and here's what i'm going to give you if you do it the second part, which we're going to begin next session, we're going to cut this particular lesson in two because it's just too much material to cover at once. The second part is when we see the opening of heaven. And behold, I saw a door standing open in heaven, it says, indicating the things that will take place after this, metatafta, metatafta in Greek, referring to the future history and the eternity. So next week, God willing, Tuesday, God willing, we've had a lot of obstacles technologically. We're still making our, our best effort here in our very mobile world and our desert existence to make sure that we have good connection. But God willing, Tuesday, we'll join you again, and we'll go through the next section. This will be the beginning of book two, volume two. We've arrived at volume two. We're done with book one of the Elder Athanasius Lectures. And we're going on to volume two. And with that, we're going on to part two of the book of Revelation. Uh, and so thanks be to God. I'm looking forward to seeing your questions now. And I appreciate your patience. And forgive me for not having tonight a PDF available, which I think, you know, certainly is very helpful. We will work on it. We will fin finalize it next uh, by next Tuesday. God willing, we'll have the PDF posted uh, before we begin the next lecture. So all of you on Crowdcast uh, and uh, Patreon. Um, you're going to get that, as usual, uh, posted in Patreon. And all of you who have not joined us in Patreon, you ought to consider joining us and having access to our question and answer sessions every Thursday, all of our PDFs that we produced, all of our past lectures, all of our past question and answer sessions. We're talking about dozens and dozens and dozens of, of question and answer sessions. I, let's see, we've been doing this now two full years, so over two years and uh, two months, and we've had a more or less a question and answer session almost every week so count out that that's what 400 uh, to 50 100 150 no no i'm not I'm good it's, uh, it's about 100 and something question and answer sessions yeah terrible math and math I don't know. first question about being lukewarm is it similar to matthew 12 30 whoever is not with me is against me whoever is not gathered with me scatters And St. Anthony, do not have a single thing to do with schismatics and absolutely nothing to do with heretics. As you know, I myself have avoided them due to their Christ-hating and heterodox heresy. Well, certainly a lack of faith is going to make you lukewarm, but probably even worse than lukewarm. We're talking about Christians in the church who profess orthodoxy. So I don't think the second one applies to lukewarm. Um, you can be a very zealous heretic, and there are a lot of them. Uh, but they're not... They're not um, they're not zealous in the spirit of God. They're zeal not according to knowledge. So I don't think the first actually is applicable. Uh, the second, rather. The first uh, is... Yes, it is also talking about a falling away and not a gathering in and not, and not a unity in Christ. So I don't think that's applicable to lukewarm. Lukewarm are people in the church. You and I. Let's be honest, we're lukewarm. We're lukewarm in our struggles and our frustrations and our fasting and the prayer of the heart, right? We're lukewarm. So it's all about us here. This is, uh, this is he's speaking to us. And we need to repent. And we, need to, we need to go back to our first love. We need to uh, make it absolute number one priority. And it needs to guide us and, and determine our whole lives. Next question, I see friends and church members turn towards New Age spiritual beliefs. Wow. Orthodox Christians turning toward New Age practices. Yoga, Reiki, meditation, healing with crystals. Unbelievable. Where do they get this stuff? Where do they get this stuff? The apostles... The the uh, the uh, the saints, 
uh, the miracle workers, uh, the clairvoyant ones, all these things that we have in the it's so rich, rich, rich in the Orthodox tradition, the Orthodox history, the Orthodox lives of saints, all of that, that doesn't interest them. And they're going to turn away. And they're going to find uh, whatever peace is fleeting in this world that they, these things might offer, offer. It's fleeting peace is what they're really interested in. That's first. Put yoga first, put uh, meditation, whatever that means. We don't usually, I mean, we, we can talk about an orthodox version of that, but that's not what they're talking about here, right? That's something different. Anyway, it's a tragedy. And you say, your question goes on. They take communion and think nothing of it. This is tragedy. Shouldn't our priests talk with them? And let them know it is wrong to combine these practices with orthodox Jews? Absolutely. He, he will be rebuked along with the, with the bishop of Laodicea if he is delinquent in pointing out the boundaries, teaching them the presuppositions, and putting them before a decision. We priests need to put our people before decisions. They need to make decisions in this life. Be with Christ. Put away these things that are opposite to Christ. Put away the worldly way. Do not have two masters. That prophetic stance of a priest is, is not, it's not just for one or two priests in regeneration. It's not just for the bishop to come once in a while and say a, a hard saying. It's for every pastor to put people, people before a decision. I want Christ. Decide. That should be the way a pastor, I think, approaches his people. Otherwise, we are part of the problem. Keeping them lukewarm, keeping them self-satisfied, keeping them secularized. We're going to pay the price for that. Absolutely. Can you say a few words about how the so-called green agenda is connected to pagan earth worshiping idolatry as well as depopulation? Uh, that's a very good question. I'm not an expert on that. So my, my answer is going to be very piecemeal, and I really don't think I can give it a, a deep answer. I've not, uh, I've not spent much time on it. And uh, frankly, I'm going to basically just respond to what, whatever I have for you, which is on the spot. So you take it or leave it. And, you know, I'm happy if you leave it, if, if it's not satisfying for you. It doesn't satisfy your, your, uh, your needs there. So uh, the so-called green agenda, uh, I'm assuming we're talking about the global warming idea, about the agenda, the tax, and, and, and the whole transformation uh, of energy supply and all the, the, the whole uh, nine yards of transforming uh, society into, uh, you know, uh, renewable energy and all the rest. Okay. Uh, but mostly the, 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 the uh, fear mongering uh, about the world all ending in, you know, five years and all that whole uh, agenda to, we make society according to this thing. What's wrong with it? Now, there's some aspects, as always, that are true, that are, we can get behind as Orthodox. Obviously, we need to have take care of, of, of the nature around us. We need to have respect for it. We have respect for the animals. We have respect for all of nature. We need to live ascetically and not, uh, not buy into the whole consumer mentality. Everything is cheap and inexpensive and thrown away and all the rest. All of these things are almost no-brainers for the Orthodox Christian. If somebody comes and says this to us, we say, well, yeah, of course, that's how we're all struggling to live. We're struggling to live with respect, keep the, keep the garden, as, as the Lord said to, the, to Adam. So in that sense, we're not talking about a green agenda, are we? I don't think so. I think the term's used pejoratively, and it means the politicization of that, the use of that, uh, that you know, apocalyptic vision to corral people into uh, a new, uh, you know, uh, green uh, society, which is going to have all kinds of implications for their way of life, for the control of their way of life. Um, it doesn't respect people's freedom. It doesn't call them to virtue. Uh, it's, it can and, and probably will be very totalitarian in many ways in terms of its uh, uh, implementation because, of course, people don't change their habits without great struggle, and so they have to oppose, impose that on people. So there's going to be a tyrannical methodology behind that if they're going to have any success. With it. And well, in so far as it's connected now to pagan earth worshiping idolatry as well as depopulation. Well, depopulation is, is much easier to connect it to that agenda because they've said long ago in the 60s 
that the world is overpopulated and people need to be depopulated. It needs to be depopulated. And so they have arrived now. I mean, COVID was part of the whole COVID scare and the vaccine rollout. Many people, I think, rightly are saying it's connected to a, a, a demonic agenda to depopulate the earth. I don't think that's a crazy thing to say anymore, and it shouldn't be. But I remember when I was even uh, in college and I was doing pro-life work, uh, and people were talking back in the late 80s about the push for depopulation. I was a huge part of the agenda of the pot, of the uh, pro-abortionists and why the globalists wanted both abortion and depopulation as a big part of their of their drive. And of course, that's to do with uh, controlling the earth as much as it does actually eliminating human beings from the earth. And so it's uh, it's. Depopulation, I think, is is very close to the green agenda. They they'll tell you straight out that we've got to get rid of the vast majority of people if we're going to have a future in this earth. And we're talking going from what seven eight billion down to one or less, a couple hundred million. I, I forget the number, but that's a part of the green agenda. That's different. now going to pagan earth worshiping idolatry. I don't know much about that actually. How to connect those two? I think it's probably. Not a far. I mean, if you're worshiping the earth, you're going to be a very, logically speaking, be a very great zealot for the green agenda. Obviously, right? If you think that this is a divine reality we need to maintain and not a fall, then the green agenda is going to be a big part of your uh, your uh, cosmology, you know, and your theology. Uh, so that's that's about as much as I know. I don't know much more about the New Age movement to tell you exactly how it's birthed. The green agenda, or it's uh, it's a co- major accomplish. Uh, sorry, a major. Um, let's say co-worker in crime. I forget the, the phrase I wanted. So that's what I got to say. On that. What's the next question? Why does my mind lean towards Roman Catholicism, but my heart towards Orthodoxy? Uh, well, I would say that you probably have spent a long time. I'm um, just guessing, Robert in the realm of Catholicism and Western theology and Western philosophy. And so um, you've grown used to that and it's very convincing to you and it has a lot to say about this world. Uh, it's of course following after Greek f- philosophers, Aristotle and all the rest. And so it's very satisfying. Uh, I, a lot of the various um, religious uh, theories and religious movements uh, such as perennialism and others are very appealing to the mind uh and they you know can very much uh uh depending on the case they can either very much you know expound upon aspects of this world and the creation uh and uh, the implications uh, uh the beauty of creation and the implications of all these things and the order and all this and or they could if they're in a, in a uh, in the realm of a very bad and destructive philosophy they could be very appealing uh you know in a different kind of way but the mind that you're talking about is the rational intellect. That is not the noose. That is not the organ of communion with God. That is not that which God has given to us to worship him. The rational part of the intellect, if you want, the the, the diania in Greek, right, is not the noose. There's two different things. They're separate. They're understood differently. The noose is where the heart prays. Uh, the, you need to take that noose into the heart. The mind of, of Christ in the scriptures is noose. Not a knowledge about creation. The mind of Christ is not understanding the way of the world or the way of creation or the way of, uh, you know, uh, the order of uh, even the church, even the life of the people in this world in the church. It's not even that is uh, the noose is 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 the the spiritual and intellect the heart of man the spirit of man these are more or less different aspects of the same reality uh is what your heart your whole the whole man really the, the man man is found first and foremost the seat of his heart the, the heart is the seat of man right that's where the true man dwells the hidden man of the heart is what needs to be discovered that's where you commune with god um, and so, um, if you remain dedicated toward 
a rational knowledge about creation, about God, about his revelation, and that is what you love, and that's your first love, you will be drawn toward the various ideologies, the various philosophies, the various religious movements, because that's where they're excelling, and that's where they're spending all their time largely ignorant of the hidden man of the heart and the, and the kingdom of God within, and the spiritual life it draws and leads people to God. But of the two, it's obvious the hierarchy and the hierarchy, the noose is above the rational intellect. Knowledge of God is above knowledge of his creation. Uh, you have to put the right things in order. And so you should follow your heart, obviously. Give me your heart, he says. Not, he didn't say give me your dhyana, your rational intellect. The Lord says, give me your heart. That's where you're going to commune with God. Follow that, and you will find over time, if you submit your mind to your spirit and your heart, and you follow the heart and not allow your mind to lead you in the sense of irrational intellect, but your news to be brought into your heart and to, to be unified, that can only happen in the mysteries ultimately, you will find that all of that activity of the mind will be baptized, will be purified, and you'll see it in a very different light. But you've got to crucify your desires. You've got to crucify yourself. You've got to send the cross. Again, what did he say? Peter's the apostle, the, the Lord said to Peter, the apostle Peter there, eat my flesh, drink my blood. What did he say? You're going to leave too? He says, you're going to leave too. At that point, if he had used his head, he would have left. If he would have trusted his dianya, his rational, like he would have left with the others. That's what they did. They said, this is a hard saying. I can't crucify my mind on this saying. This is too much to accept. Apostle Peter didn't say, that's crazy. I can't, I can't accept that. Trusting himself, his rational intellect to judge. He said, you have the words of eternal life. Nothing's an accident in scripture. Every last word has meaning. You have the words of eternal life. What you're saying is eternal life. I trust you. I do not understand you. I trust you. You see the hierarchy of things? You see what you got to do first? You see where you need to follow Christ? And then that all the other activity of the mind, heart, and soul will be baptized, purified, and aligned properly. And then you will see that rational intellect and its knowledge for what it is. This worldly knowledge. For you to go from A to Z in this life. It's not meant to bring you into communion with God. That's not where you're going to find and love and worship and, and, and be in communion with God in those thoughts, in that analysis. All right, so it's not a surprise Catholicism draws the mind because that's of this world. It's the dhyanya, it's not the noose. And the heart, of course, is going to be drawn. And orthodoxy draws the heart because orthodoxy is the body of Christ. It's the light, it's the divine theanthropic life on earth. And, and, the, and of course, give me your heart, he says, right? The Lord says, so follow your heart. Father Peter, would you mind saying if it's okay to read any books that are not from the Orthodox Holy Saints? Uh, I think there's uh, precedent in Orthodox tradition, Orthodox history, or the saints' lives for there to be, of course, literature outside the lives of the saints. Uh, it's usually in the lives of the saints pertaining to the journey of this uh of this uh, of the church in this world and it has a, fu a function and a practical purpose uh it's not an end in itself but it's a means for the upbuilding and the life of the church so ignore the music in the background that's just a, a it's a clock that is uh, i guess it's seven o'clock and it's ringing so it'll go off in a second um so you know, history books, very important. Uh, practical books like archaeology or, 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 I'm sorry, uh, architecture, if you're building a house or, uh, or any number of other things are all blessed. And, and of course, people can read them if, if for a purpose, though, right? For a purpose, not uh, just to pass your time and become a mindless, uh, uh, you know, uh, homo sapien, <laughs> but to further your, your life in this world on the path to 
the heaven. I mean, it has, it should have a good and important purpose for the right ordering of your family, for the right ordering of your life. Uh, I don't think that the saints would read, you know, tabloids or would read uh, fashion magazines or would read, you know, all these uh, various, none of that is going to be a part of the life of a saint. Uh, but certainly other things that are important, you know, history, uh, literature uh, uh, that is um, is godly and beneficial. All of that is blessed. Uh, why did Saint Mart Saint Eustine Martyr, Saint Justin Martyr, say that Socrates and Plato were unknowingly Christians? Yet the Church has King Solomon as a saint, despite didn't believe in Christ and other improper things. He didn't believe in Christ. King Solomon didn't believe in Christ. What are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. Um, the people of God were the people of God. There's no way around it. You can't make people who were, you know, a part of idolatry. Plato, Plato is not, his philosophy is the source in many ways of heresy. The church did not embrace Plato in a holistic sense, in a undiscerning sense, in a, you know, a blind sense. They could never embrace Plato. He had a lot of delusional ideas that ended up creeping into various heretical post-Christian teachings. Socrates, is a, as from what we know of him and what he's witnessed to, is unique in the sense that there is actually a passage that seems to point to the Messiah, to Christ, that, that there would have to be God would become, become man, he says. So he does seem to be pointing to the incarnation. Uh, he is, seems to be very virtuous. He seems to be in some ways persecuted because of, of his virtue. And so there's Socrates is a much more, I think, of a case to be made uh, for uh, much more respect to be paid to Socrates personally than to Plato. But I know people, some people think Plato was made up Socrates, but I don't think that's the majority opinion. Anyway, um, there is some respect paid to the various philosophers that did speak truth and did pave the way. But philosophy itself was never embraced in and of itself as a source of divine enlightenment and, and knowledge of God by the church fathers. They did not embrace the philosophers. Far from it. Far from it. They used the language of the philosophers. They used the concepts of the philosophers. They baptized a lot of the meanings and slightly changed them. But they were not driven by them. They were not led by them. They did not lead people to them. They used them as a tool in order to bring people to Christ. So I don't think we're talking about the same thing. King Solomon, for all his warts and his sins, he was the son of David, and he was the he was in the line of David, and he had that blessing within the household of faith in the Old Testament that none of the pagans could have. And that's just a historical reality. It's not favoritism on the part of God. Uh, uh, he is not a, a respecter of persons, it says in the Acts of the Apostles, right? He's not a prosopolitis, as they say, but he loves everyone and, and calls everyone equally. But the people of God were set aside and set apart precisely to bring about the mother of God, to bring about, in other words, the incarnation. And so they're going to have a separate and, and, and honored place in uh, the uh, the uh, um universe of uh, of the saints and the stars in the, in the heavens uh and solomon uh, had much wisdom and brought much to the table in that sense so i don't know i don't know what else i can say there that's my two words next was christ before resurrection limited in his knowledge because of his human nature no no he's not did he know knew everything yes or was limited and typical of his time and culture no he was the god man bogdan he was theanthropos of course he knew everything there's no gradual growth in his knowledge. Uh, there's no gradual appropriation of, of his divinity. Uh, that would be a heresy. Uh, he knew everything, uh, and, it, and it doesn't matter if uh, his dhyanya was not uh, developed as, as we expect. This is the God man. He's, the, he's, he's, yeah, you know, doesn't, he's not subject to the, the laws of the fallen human being. Uh, and so we have uh, divine humanity here. Of course, he's going to know everything. And uh, he knew everything about everyone. 
and he knew and everything he did was for was because he knew it i mean his, his, his pastoral let's say work was based on his knowledge of everyone and everything i mean it says clearly in the scriptures in many places he knew their hearts he knew what he knew what they were thinking that's something it's not something he gradually obtained because of some kind of uh, effort that would be a heresy that would be a heresy How can we speak out and help others we love with the teachings of our faith when no one will listen and, are, and we are told what to do uh, and are told what to do and are told what to, what do we know since we are sin as well? Okay, let me, sorry guys, I butchered that. How can we speak out and help others we love with the teaching of our faith when no one will listen? And are told what do we know since we sin as well okay so people are just basically like what do you know and why should we listen to you and they don't listen so you have people who have a bad disposition toward you for whatever reason or for the church or for the faith it doesn't doesn't matter really the reason the problem here with the disposition is you can't change their disposition so what can you do you need to be one who puts them to um, their brain to work. How can I put this? In other words, when you see somebody who doesn't have a good disposition, you ask them questions. You don't tell them what you think. You don't preach to them. You don't argue with them. As a rule, you ask them questions. Why? Because questions make them think and consider and reflect. And that's exactly what they have to do. They have to get out of their tunnel vision and step back and question themselves their thoughts their assumptions and so we ask them questions and they come and they say you know xyz is not true icons should not be venerated then you start they don't have a good disposition as a parent you start asking the questions well um did christ become man yes he did when he became man uh did people see him and and and, and observe him yes they did uh, if they if, if, if therefore he revealed himself as a man, can we not depict him as a man? What is it about the old? So you you do the Socratic method, so to speak, and in in terms of how can you help them on a personal discursive way. Much more than that, you can help them through prayer. You can help them through getting on your knees and praying to God. And and that love, that sacrifice that petition to the one who can and does work in the heart of man is going to be very beneficial for them so you pray fervently for them you offer them their names up in prayer and then you ask them questions and you do not come and push and try to force them at all the lord did not do that he did not try to force anyone and he did not uh he, everyone was free to walk away and that's how it is in, in the spiritual life. They have to want to be with Christ. And if they have a good disposition buried underneath their arrogance and their pride, God will bring it about. They'll have opportunities to repent. And you can facilitate that by being there for them. Uh, if they if they are like somebody in your life that you, you know, family or somebody, right? Um, and asking them questions and helping them reflect and helping them be troubled in a good way right the good uneasiness that we talk about that's our role not to go along and say it doesn't matter and let's all go out let's go pray together let's go eat together let's go do this and that and all these things that people do and they don't because they don't put first and foremost the faith and salvation they want to coexist with everyone and that that kind of coexistence is actually detrimental you can of course be friends and befriend people and your family and all the rest spend time with them but there should always be the sense that my role here is to give them the good uneasiness and i, I need to learn and pray how to do that it's a, there's no one way but that's how I, I should understand my role to love them yes to be uh you know if they're my mother father brother sister of course but at the same time they should not there should not be, I should not go along with their delusions. I should not appear to uh, be one with them in their rejection of the orthodoxy. And insofar as I can, I should give them 
those questions and that 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 witness that will say, look, your stance is not salvific. You need to, you need to reconsider your stance. Uh, Maria Page asks, would you ever teach a class in basic Greek online? Uh, is it a class teaching Greek? Is that what you're asking me? Maybe she can, uh, Maria, can you ask again, John, and clarify your question? Because there's two ways I can take the question. One is to teach Greek online. Another is to teach in Greek online, another topic. So I need a little clarification on that. I don't think I would teach Greek. I don't feel like I'm a Greek teacher. I don't feel like that's my role. So I'm not going to get online and just teach, uh, like, you know, how to learn Greek. That's not my role. But I could teach in Greek, of course. Yes, that's possible. And I'm thinking about doing that more and more, actually, to do a podcast in in Greek. Uh, that's something that I would like to do. But we'll see. Another question from Trench. Trench is good at questions. Wow. Thoughts on Numbers 36.6. No, I'm not going to give a – I don't think I want to give a scriptural commentary on the fly. Uh, let them marry whom they think best, only within the family of the tribe of the father, their father shall they marry. Yeah. Okay. We should only marry in the in the tribe of the God the Father, and that's the church. Yes, I'm not for mixed marriages. I don't have any, I don't see mixed marriages at all supported by the fathers, the saints, and, and the theology of the church. I don't see how people can do mixed marriages in the Orthodox Church. It doesn't make any sense. There's no defense of it. Never has been. There won't be. It's not possible to defend it. How can someone commune of the mysteries without having been baptized, initiated into the church? And yet, marriage is a mystery in the church. So there's no theological basis for mixed marriages, if that's what you're asking me uh, and to comment on here. Uh, people should marry in the church to Orthodox Christians. You're going to say, well, it's very hard. Well, it's hard for us, but it's not hard for God. Uh, and, you know, obviously there are people out there who become Orthodox after meeting their future husband or wife, and they're baptized, and then they marry, and that's blessed. But to go and to have a mixed marriage ceremony in the heterodox church or in the Orthodox church for, is, to me, not following the saints. It's not, not something that's going to be, it's also oftentimes very problematic. How many people write me and say, my husband is not Orthodox, either they converted or they, there's a mixed marriage. And he never comes to church with me, and it's very, it's very problematic. It's very hard. I can't do it. Many such instances. Of course, there are others who become Orthodox after marriage. Thank God. But we don't, as a church, we are not following the Holy Fathers when we encourage and bless and engage and indiscriminately do mixed marriages. Because I don't see how that's defensible. Uh, so Mar Mar Maria did say, teach how to teach and to read Greek. And I, I don't think that's my role. I don't think I'm going to be doing that. Uh, there are people who can do that. There are people who can do that um, online. And uh, I encourage them to do that. But that's not my role. Okay. I don't know what else. If there's any other questions, John, are we reached the end of the questions? Probably have a lot less questions tonight because of the crowdcast uh, inability to do crowdcast tonight. But uh, hopefully, all of our crowdcasters came over here and joined us. Question from Stavula: Prisoners tend to avoid conflict with clergy by limiting their involvement activity in the church. Is this okay? Because many of the clergy came from Protestant and Roman Catholicism. Uh, you should avoid c conflict, of course, with your clergy in matters that do not pertain to the faith, that do not pertain to the salvation of the people, in matters that are secondary, matters that are, you know, not really our business or something like that. Of course, you should avoid conflict. If there is a serious departure on the part of the priest from the tra holy tradition, the life in Christ, and the holy faith, the dogma, that I would have to say we cannot remain indifferent. We cannot avoid conflict. That's not our role, and that's not love. And if we're going to follow the example of the saints and our Lord tonight who, who rebuked the, the bishop, uh, I'm, and we're not called to rebuke the bishop or priest necessarily, uh, but we are definitely called 
just confess the faith. And if you have a priest or a bishop who is uh, in delusion and heresy, teaching the various theories of ecumenism that essentially do away with the boundaries of the church and bless and sanctify, so to speak, uh, heterodoxy, then you have someone who is an obstacle to his own salvation and the salvation of other people. And you cannot simply say it doesn't matter. You have to at least pray and you have to, I think, at least go and speak to your priest, speak to your bishop, and write something, express something, and 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 resist and not be a part of it. You have to state, I'm not of that. I'm not with that. That's not Christ. And you have to confess that before men. And Christ will confess your name before the Father, as he, as he pledged and said. Uh, so um, it depends on what the topic is. It depends on what we're talking about. You have to have discernment, but if it's matters that are pertaining to salvation, if he is, a, if a priest is is erring grievously, and leading people to a worldly way, and not the the the, the, the narrow path uh, of uh, of asceticism and confession of faith, then I think we have to have to act in some way, and it needs to be very, of course, um, it needs to be very respectful. Uh, we need to go through the right channels. Uh, we need to um, pray fervently before we do it. We need, be, we need to write it and maybe pass it by. If we're going to write something, uh, you know, uh, objecting to certain practices like prayer with heretics or things like that, we need to pass it by probably a spiritual father or, or someone else. Uh, uh, but we cannot remain indifferent. There's no indifference in the church because there's love in the church. And indifferent people don't love. Right? You can't be indifferent. No, you should be indifferent to things which don't pertain to you in the life of somebody else. You shouldn't be curious and all that. But in fact, we're talking about the faith and the life of the church, we're talking about salvation in the church. There's no room for indifference. But we're all going to bear one another's burden. How you go about it is another discussion. We could do a whole lecture on that. And you have to be humble and discerning and prayerful, and you have to be careful and you have to be respectful, but you have to do it. If you're going to be somebody who loves, you're going to have to speak up against these various abuses, these departures, these heresies, uh, COVIDism, and all the rest. And that's how, that's how these things are driven out of the church, is when everyone plays their part in making sure that the body is healthy and there's not these poisons of heresy and, and worldliness circulating in the body which is you know salvation for the world so it's a it's a loving your neighbor and loving god in the most you know important way all right i think that's it i think we're going to wrap it up i think i'm exhausted and we've been traveling all day we're on our way as i said north please pray for us as we travel we will be back here um did i miss a question i think i do have some more questions john Okay, well, I don't know if I can do too many more, but we'll try. Uh, I think, uh, did I answer the question from Hokulani, John? Let's go back to the questions. Hang on a second. Uh, yes, I did answer your question about... Oh, no, I didn't actually. No, 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 I didn't answer this question. I, somehow I skipped this. I'm sorry. Your question was, when you said only ourselves can do the hard work without being pushy, how do we help someone along the way to take more initiative toward Christ? Well, again, you, Christ himself will not push. Christ himself will not force. Christ himself respects the freedom of each person. He speaks. He knocks. He invites. He, he, you know, he calls us to pray for our neighbor, for our brother or sister. He calls us to, to, uh, when asked, give a good word and an apology for the faith and the hope that's in us. He calls us to give examples, great examples of the people they can be inspired. He, he calls us to, when it's discerning and not pushy, say a word about the truth of the gospel, a saint of a life of a saint, uh, which is not going to be interpreted as you must do this you should do that right but it's laying it out there and it's appropriate uh so you can't 
you can't make somebody some do something they don't they not they don't want. You can't make them into disciples. You can't. But you can give them an example and push them in the right direction through your your example and through discerningly chosen words, the right time, the right place, uh, and prayer, fervent prayer for that person. Uh, that's what I see in the lives of the saints. I don't see that even in elders. Even when you have a spiritual father, a discerning spiritual father is gonna is gonna see you, understand where you are, and say what is appropriate to you at that stage. And that's how it is with people outside who are not understanding, not coming, not desiring Christ. You have to you have to discern where they are, and analogous, analogously act, right, and not push and 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 just spurt you know spurt out and blurt out i should say uh whatever just to just to, just to say hey i told them you know that's not that's not virtuous it's not what god is asking us well, hopefully that helps next question i think this is the last one no more questions john is there any knowledge that is dangerous to teach i'm thinking of teaching cognitive functions which seem to be true and logical However, knowing this can lead to potential obsession. Um, I, you know, I'm not your spiritual father. I don't know your particular situation. I don't know what you, what, what you know, I'd probably want much more information before I told you personally what you should do. So this answer is not a response to you personally, and I don't think I can give you a, a, an answer, okay, frankly. But I will just generally say that what we teach, what we obsess, uh, not obsess on, sorry, what we spend a lot of time on, that is a that is going to affect us, and it's going to form us. Uh, you know, if we spend all day thinking about money, uh, if we spend all day thinking about sports, if we spend all day thinking about things, building, that's what's going to be filled with our heads. When we go to sleep, when we dream, when we get up in the morning, it's, that's that's going to form us in many ways. And so, these things need to be used extremely wisely. Our time and our and our thoughts and our and what we invest our life into should be very chosen with an eye toward salvation and eternity. So um, you say it could be very obsessive. Well, then I, I think that's a that's a red light. That could be a red light for sure. Uh, it's not going to allow you pure uh, thoughts and the quiet, the quieting of the thoughts, the hesikia to go deep in. If you're obsessive about something, you become obsessive, and night and day you're you're going through these. Uh, uh, cognitive functions, teaching cognitive functions. Um, you know, I guess you could try it out and see, excuse me. And then if after a, a, a six month period, you, you realize that this is really badly affecting me, you could, if you really think that you want to do this, you're planning on doing this, then you could do that. But again, I can't, I can't answer you personally. I think there is a, a bit of a red light when you talk about obsession and you talk about you know, getting really deep and then becoming obsessive about it, that's 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 possibly a, a not, a, not a good thing for prayer. It's not going to help you to pray. So in that sense, it could be problematic, but you have to sp ask spiritual father for more particularities. All right. We've reached the end of our lecture tonight on Lesson 6 on Revelation. We appreciate your time and your attention. Uh, we're going to be back here on Tuesday, God willing. We may not be back here the following Tuesday. We're have, we're, that's the eve of the conference, of the Uncle Mountain Press Conference. starts on the 7th, 6th, but we're going to be up there on the 5th. So two Tuesdays from now, we may have to cancel or postpone, so have that in mind. Uh, God willing, we'll be here on Tuesday if it's coming up, and we'll pick up uh, the second section of Revelation, as we mentioned tonight. And we'll be here on Thursday of next week, God willing, uh, for the question and answer session, as usual, in Crowdcast, although if something comes up, we are traveling. So check it out. Check your emails before the session. Uh, you'll be notified in Crowdcast if it's going to be canceled. Um, but thank you very much. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, and we'll see you on Tuesday. And we'll chant the Troparian now to the cross of Christ, to our Lord, and in honor of the cross of Christ. So son kiri e don lonso kev lo yi son 
Simpleronomi and Sudi can to Vasilevsi Tatavarvaron Dorumenos Keton son filaton Dia to Stavrusu Politema To the prayers of the Holy Father Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen.